all these uh, new technologies that are emerging and we are discussing like where is are we headed to and and this is really a, a hot topic that for all ux designers and i think i'm not the person to talk about this alone uh, and in fact when i talked to melissa early this year uh, she advised that why don't we we do a panel kind of thing where uh, people express their ideas. So right now we have uh, our panelists uh, over there. Uh, we have people from e-commerce. John is from e-commerce background, very strong, very strong on UX. Uh, Melissa has been in the, in the design industry for a long time, in, in the user experience. She has done lots of things. Then we have Kaitlin, who is from, um, she is from the uh, research agency background, uh, design agency or research agency, sorry. Um, design agency. Design agency. Uh, we have Shiva who has done a lot of work in medical research, uh, user research. We have Che who has done uh, UX research, he's doing in DBS. Um, then we have Sulab who is from the software industry, he's a project manager at JLL. Um, so we have mix of pe mix of people here coming from different backgrounds and a lot of, with, uh, let's say, a lot of experience. So they will talk about a topic which will be moderated by Melissa. And then, uh, once this discussion happens, uh, you guys can ask questions uh, after the discussion is happening. And I will leave it to Melissa to decide whether you can ask a question in between or, or you, you need to answer the, ask the question after hearing their views. That's your call. Uh, but yes, uh, I expect this discussion to be very noisy because uh, I know all of them and all of them are actually good talkers. <laughs> they can discuss on topics, especially UX, for a long time. Um, and, and, and therefore, I think it makes sense for me to leave the stage now and then let them hear. After this, there is this wine appreciation session, so don't hurry up. There is enough wine, I think. Um, and then, uh, yeah, after that, we'll call it a close. Yeah? Okay. Any other questions that you have, concerns that you have? Because after that, I'll just run away from here. Okay, none. That means we are doing great. Okay. Yeah, Melissa, welcome, welcome everybody. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll try to be on time for you guys because I know it's kind of late, it's the end of the day and you've been through probably three days of amazingness. So um, today we're gonna be talking about UX and AI future, like what's the next generation of experience design? And I know there's a lot of buzzwords, but there's also a lot of real industry about it. Um, we've got about over 90 years of a collective experience up here. So as Cool Deep was introducing, we've got people from e-commerce back, we have people from finance, we have people from product, digital agency, and tech. So what we really want to do is cover like what emerging technologies are impacting their industry, what that means to UX, what that means to our process, and what that means to our roles. So we're going to kind of do a Q&A discussion. So we'll be talking. It's going to be a little holistic and informal as we go. When we finish, we'll try to save about 10 minutes, if a little bit less, to you guys on the floor if you have any questions you want to ask, if you have hard questions, if you disagree with something, please do. All right, so before we get started, I know that Cool Deep did intros, but I'd like for the panelists to be able to introduce themselves so you kind of know who's who up here and how they're going to answer. So my name is Caitlin Robinson. I'm a creative director of experience design at RGA, and we are a digital ad agency that really focuses in on product and service development. Um, so I've been with the company for just over eight years, and I started in our New York office working on North American business before transferring into EMEA, um, and have been here in the APAC region for the last two years. Uh, I think my focus has really been on uh, developing product and services for brands like Nike and Samsung, as well as companies like NTUC uh, here in Singapore. Um, but the major theme, I think, for me as a UX practitioner has been, how do we actually get to know our global markets and our global customers um, in a hands-on sort of way in order to build solutions that are ultimately dynamic and personalized to their needs? Hi, I'm Che. I'm from DBS. Currently, I'm working as a UX researcher there. Um, uh, to be honest, this is my first job really focusing on user research and um, previously I was a designer as well, like uh, most of the people here. And um, I think um, uh, user research is actually an area um, very, getting very popular, especially for client side. And um, we are building a huge team here to help us to kind of look into the data analytics 
to analyze them and also to work with the business team to identify the business issues. So my role at DBS is actually predominantly a, a kind of facilitator in some ways to make sure that these things are happening and then also coordinate with the different country emerging markets like India and Indonesia where um, we need to focus a lot on what the customers' uh, segmentations are and what they need. Um, I think building a, um, an app is easy, but understanding what people need is very, actually very important because sometimes you just build apps that nobody wants to use, right? So <laughs> we, we are facing issues right now with, with uh, things that are just features which are very, you know, very, very common and, and you know, people are having, other banks are having the same thing as well. So how do we differentiate ourselves is the next uh, question we are asking ourselves. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, John Derrigan, a principal UX uh, consultant. I'm currently doing uh, contract work. Uh, I've spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time in the UX field, uh, but started off uh, in design, uh, as probably many UX practitioners have. Uh, design and usability, uh, so I uh, ran a small design agency with several people uh, in Toronto for about 10 years, uh, and then really wanted to dedicate myself to, to UX and go full in on that. Uh, and so I uh, was uh, director of uh, Technocrat, which was, uh, which was a UX agency in Melbourne, uh, and also uh, Born Digital in uh, Melbourne. Uh, and now recently I've been working in uh, Jakarta and in Ho Chi Minh, uh, really focusing on uh, the UX of e-commerce. And that's uh, it's been really interesting. So. Hi, uh, I'm Shiva. I have a background in product. So both physical and digital have been working in product for the past uh, five, six years. Recently, I've shifted to digital, like a lot of people. Uh, in product, I've uh, done both uh, medical products and uh, FMCG, consumer product, product design, hard code. And uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of uh, usability testing, both for product and for, uh, for software, all around the world, in US, South Africa, Indonesia, Philippines, India. Uh, currently, I'm working for a firm called MindLens Worldwide. We do a lot of uh, U, uh, UX for the government. We do their, uh, we look at their backend systems and see how we can help them renew and uh, get up to date with the rest of the world. Thanks, Shiva. Uh, I'm Sulab. So, um, in my current role, I work for APEC region as a project manager, and probably I'm kind of odd one out here, so my background is developer, not a designer. So probably I can provide a different perspective because I always see there's a, there's a gap about utility and usability. So someone was talking about app here, so of course we want apps who are, can be really used, so, but they should have a functionality, so I think probably we would be touching on those that how usability and utility should be combined together to give best user experience to people. Okay, thank you. So I'm Melissa, and I've been working for the last 20 years in experience design. I'm currently uh, experience director, very similar to Caitlin, at an agency called Possible. But my history before that was a lot of product and you know software as a service, as well as now more on the marketing and digital transformation side. So, like I said, you've got some good experience. We purposely wanted to get a diverse panel so that we could get a very different point of view from each of these guys. All right, so Caitlin. Shay, can she have the mic? Because I'm going to ask you first with... <laughs> the hot seat. The Here we go. hot one. You sat right next to me. So with the emerging technologies that are hitting, and I know this is kind of a little bit of a broad question, especially for a global agency, because you have multiple types of customers. Let's just pinpoint what emerging technology that you see that's coming, that you feel that's impacting um, your industry the most. So I think, to me, the technology, maybe that's not impacting us today, but I think that will quickly start to impact us in pretty huge ways, is the blockchain. Um, and I think that that's because the blockchain, potent, uh, let me back up a second and say, um, a lot of what this panel is gonna talk about is AI, and AI is built on data. And I think as practitioners, we take for granted that customers are just giving us their data. They're giving us, they're giving brands and companies their data. But what happens when customers start to hold their own personal information on the blockchain, providing limited or timed access 
to their personal information so that it's not just a blanket sea of data that we can pull from, but it starts to become more control. Um, and in that way, I think we're going to start to see big shifts in terms of the products, services that we can ultimately create or even the ways in which brands can respond to customers, the permissions that they have to ask for customer data, um, and the responsibility that they're going to have to ultimately use that in a responsible way. Whereas today, I think a lot of customers give up their data. Often it becomes dark data in terms of companies just collecting it without actually having a reason yet to use it. Um, and I think that will start to shift in the very near future. So you say Hello. So you say near future, like what are we looking at? Is this next year? Is this two years? Is this five years? Are you seeing some of it starting to be adapted today and some of the policies and things that are happening? Yeah, I think you're starting to see it in the early wave and early adopters. Um, those people who know how to access and get their information onto the blockchain, I think are going to start to see more mass adoption um, in the next five years when companies are going to build easier access points for the day-to-day -day lay consumer. But I think it's only going to be um, an ever-increasing uptick in terms of people starting to become more conscious about how and when their data is used, where it's stored. I mean, with every breach um, of customer data that happens out there in the industry, I think there's only so much that, um, or so often that that can happen before customers really start to rail against that and try to take control in big ways. And I think that will push policy um, at the end of the day and ultimately also force brands to really think about, do I want to own this data anymore? Because I think all of my clients are like, I want to own this data. I want it to be mine. I don't want to have to share it with anybody else because data is like gold, it's like power. But at the end of the day, when they also become culpable for some of these data breaches, then what? You know, and I think that will start to become an ever-increasing conversation uh, in the marketplace. Great. In this button. John, what about you? What are, what are you seeing? I want to connect on to what you were just saying because that's, that's exactly where things are going. All the conversations I've had with people over the past couple of months in particular all point in this direction of blockchain, cryptocurrency, all of this having a major impact on what we're going to be designing. So I think of an e-commerce perspective, creating an account and doing the, the, the financial transaction, that's all out the door, how, what we've been practicing since the 90s. Yeah, we've been refining that and, and we've simplified the process of adding a credit card into an account. But at the end of the day, this is going to completely throw that all apart and we need to be on top of that now. And I think the practitioners, that are gonna do really well are already mindful of that. And they're already trying to figure out what does that interaction look like with a customer? Because it doesn't look like what it is now. And I think uh, there'll be a, a hockey stick adoption rate. I think there'll just be suddenly some pivotal things that happen that come in combination and all of a sudden everybody jumps on board and that's gonna come pretty soon. So when you're putting the five to 10 year sort of uh, time frame for this talk, yeah. And it's just going to swoop right up at, at some point within that. And I think all of us have an appetite for it that we don't realize because we're tired of re-entering our credit card details. We're tired of having 100 different accounts on different services that we have to maintain and expend our effort to maintain. And when this promises to alleviate that from us, boy, that's, that's going to be a relief. So within e-commerce, so we've talked about blockchain as being a huge one and how our data is actually held. Are there any other emerging technologies that you were seeing within the e-commerce space that are starting to have an uptick or that you're like, you know, two years from now, this is going to be the standard norm, even though we're just trying to put the commercial value to it right now? Maybe sort of in the direction of that conversation, mm -hmm. as I'm a strong believer in AR. Okay. And I think right now the foundation's being built for that and you're going to see commercial applications for that. So people behind the scenes that are maintaining infrastructure or teaching or, or tutoring or things like that, it's, it's all starting to happen. When it starts to trickle out into the public and all of a sudden those first you know, tours in a, in a city that you travel to, they say put on your AR sunglasses and let's go on a tour and you know it's it's guiding you through that and you go wow this is an amazing experience and it becomes more and more applicable to your life why wouldn't you be buying things in that environment how many times i've gone to a startup weekend 
and somebody says, geez, it'd be really cool to have this startup where uh, the person that's wearing that dress, I want to buy that dress, but I don't know where it's from, I don't want to ask, and it's going to magically figure that out, and AR will overlay saying, hey, that's an Abercrombie, you know, it's $29.95, here's the buy button, literally. Everything will be overlaid with a digital ability to do something with that physical presence, and that's an amazing thing, and it amazingly goes into e-commerce quite nicely. Yeah. So we're going to hold that thought too, because I want to start, you were talking about the overlay of someone's dress, that gets us into ethics and privacy, right, which yeah. comes back to blockchain, which we'll touch. Sulab, what do you think? What, what, what technology is hitting either in the next five to ten? I, I get crazy saying that because when you see a lot of the charts about the future, it says 2020. Guess what? 2018 is in a week and a half, right? So, so we say five to ten, but we also mean maybe 2020 and what we're starting to see evolve today. So that's why if you kind of hear me stumble around, that's kind of what I'm visualing in my head. So, so I kind of agree with him. The AR is probably that's happening right now, probably is visible to some of us in the forms of apps or probably, you know, in terms of those visual device, uh, devices, wearable devices that are coming. But uh, I, think, I think we have to see and probably I'm seeing it's happening by 2020 is IoT that's going to probably take a larger space for, for all of us, all the things that probably devices that we are wearing or, or all the devices that we are having our home, they probably start communicating with each other. And I, I personally believe that's going to change the whole landscape. And that's where probably the user experience will play an important role because currently when it's being designed, like if I talk about software designing probably 30 years back, nobody really cared about the user experience. What they cared about the functionality, they just put the software there. Uh, think of those phones that used to come before. I mean, those were smartphones like HP tabs and all those used to come. They were smart, but they were not usable. So they were meant for really for developers or IT people. Then probably a revol revolution happened and a user-friendly smartphone arrived, then everybody probably, the whole audience here is holding, right? So I believe IoT is something that already emerging now and it's, it's uh, together with AI that's going to be the future and probably user experiences will be affected by that and we have to probably provide better experience to IoT devices where human can interact with them, yeah. Truly. Question to you, so since you are software development and with the maturity of platforms that are happening, um, do you see any of the automated tasks putting more of the focus on experience or do you, you know, and, and taking away a little bit from the software development because it can kind of run independently or do you see that there's going to be big growth for an IoT um, type engineers as well with the experience? So for sure I see the uh, more and more need of IoT engineer that will be emerging but if you see the fundamentals of IoT, they are not very far, far from the other software development that you do. So it will be easy transitions for the, you know, the current team of uh, developers available out there, and they should be easily, e they should be able to easily transit to soft uh, IoT development. And secondly, if you see uh, that dev software development is really getting rapid and easy. So nowadays it's not so difficult. Even if I ask a probably eighth grader, he should be able to write a software for anyone, right? It may not be complicated, but it, it means the overall development process is getting simpler. So I don't see an uh, issue with, you know, software developers losing jobs or you need like developer where there's not enough developers. So I don't see that. So we kind of cheated a little bit. We'll get more into that in depth with some of the other topics as well. But I figured since you were touching on IoT, wanted to dive in a little bit more. Shiva. For you, what do you think? What are you seeing as emerging technologies that are impacting by 2020, 2025? Uh, yeah, touching upon IoT, I mean, uh, from product point of view, it's all uh, in product systems. Uh, we can see it all around us, be it uh, the O bike and Mo bike. It's a, it's just not a bike. It's, a, it's a system. It's uh, the digital and the physical are have been merging and will continue to merge. So you cannot just have a individual product and think of it only as a product and every, everybody's like, you need to think of a system. So when you're designing a product, you cannot just think of the product, but you have to think of the whole ecosystem and the system that it's going to be in. So that's where it's going. You can see it in a light, if even from light bulbs to projectors or any product you take, it's not just an individual product anymore, yeah. So that's the major trend, which is probably not 10 years in the next five years itself, yeah. Okay, Shay, what about you? 
from banking? I think for, for me, right, in the banking industry, I think um, chat, chatbot, uh, you know, AI is actually one of the biggest things that, you know, we are talking, you know, in the industry now. So uh, we're talking about um, how intelligent this chatbot could perform, the transactions for us, without us, you know, for example, need, need to type in our, trans, you know, our so-called account number and you know, don't need to, to you know, put in our credit card number either. So everything can be on demand. So this is, a, this is an area that we thought um, we, could, we need a little bit of more investigation in terms of whether this is actually a safe and secure environment um, and how that integrate uh, together with other so-called um, intelligent chatbots as well, like Google, because I think there only maybe there's only one survivor. Like you know, when you open up the, the mobile itself, there's only one way you can interact is talking to your mobile phone, right? And but you don't want to open up various apps just to have a chat with that particular um, app itself. So how how do we actually have that seamless as, uh, experience? So that's one thing that we are probably investigating: how to integrate into different platforms, how to work with Google, how to work with Facebook. Maybe there's just one winner in the end, so who knows? <laughs> so service bots is what Che is talking about for those in the audience, and they estimate that by 2020, 85% um, of customer service or sales touch points are going to be done by a service bot utilizing AI. So that's when you start hearing terms like machine learning or deep learning or applied AI to some degree and natural language processing, which uses it. And we're seeing an explosion in this space, which is really exciting. Sometimes I wish I can go back 20 years to be <laughs> in this industry all over again because you guys have access. Like The reason why it's blowing up is all the different data points and the computation power that we have. So we start talking about service bots. We start talking about blockchain and privacy and who owns the data and policies that are around it. We start talking about IoT, which has opened up even the way kind of like these service bots are, right? Because it's all these different data points that can feed into how we service a person. And that gets into things like conversational UI or like virtual assistants, whether it's a box on your, on your counter like a Siri or if it's, you know, virtual through a device. Right? So um, with that, what do you think would be some of the challenges that we need to be aware of or look at, Caitlin, within, I think, not just um, to the ethics of the public, but also like UX design and like how we need to kind to, be, you know, be aware or design for these systems? So one of the biggest things that I think I'm focusing on and I'm asking my design teams to focus on is how do we ultimately combat what I call dead-end design. In the process of AI, I think we're constantly on this trajectory to optimize, right? We're gonna give you an information bubble in terms of we're gonna feed you articles that are similar to the ones that you've shown engagement with. We're gonna give you music tracks by artists that are similar to the ones that you spend the most time listening to. And sometimes I wonder if it's not a little bit of a hamster in a wheel um, situation does the hamster on the wheel realize he's not going anywhere, right? And in that way, do people realize when they're in these sort of self-optimized loops where they're getting the same information again and again and again, slightly different format, slightly different imagery, maybe a slightly different length, right? And so how do we create the opportunity for people to change and evolve? How do we allow them to take a left turn and then come back to where they were before, and then take a right turn and come back, because right now, we are just this collection of passive inputs. Every time you like something on Facebook, or every time you look at an image, it's, you know, these AI algorithms are spending time crafting this story about what it is you're gonna like. And how do we ultimately, so in trying to combat this idea of dead-end design, where we're just sort of sending people in these self-fulfilling loops, how do we allow people to change and evolve and ultimately either hit the reset button sometimes, say, I am not that person that I was yesterday, I want to be somebody different in the eyes of technology, or conversely, sort of say, I want to shift, I don't want to take a radical departure, but I want to shift and broaden my horizon. And yes, that means sometimes I'm not going to engage as much in, this, in my news feed as I did before, because not everything is as relevant, but it gives me the option to try to expand my horizon a bit. 
So how, so question to the panel and whoever wants to answer, how, how do you guys feel that we can harness this technology? So we've got these logarithms and we have all of this data input and there is the device of like learning, right, that you can have across your systems. Where do we see in our everyday process with all of your years of experience of how we have to approach, and this can be software and this can be experience design or research, where are you seeing an impact or where do you think that impact's gonna be? like in personas or journey work or, you know, how do we take that information and shape it? I think we'll end up with living apps and living websites. Because right now, if, if I was honest, and I really looked at a lot of what we do each day and we're moving menus around and, you know, we, we started with these large canvases of desktop screens and now we've gone down to these five inch screens and, Honestly, there's, there's only so many ways we can rearrange a burger menu and some content cards and stuff like that. So I think AI will play a role of saying, look, we're, I'm going to adapt this based on an individual basis, based on the circumstances that person is in at that time. That person is a 25-year-old male, just coming from work, he's in the back of a taxi. What does he want to see? And I think AI will play a role in defining that and it actually pulls us back from needing to do those things. Because really, the, when you look at the typical design of a mobile app these days, uh, we go to the safe zone and we say, well, material design. And while well, we've just put ourselves out of a job when we do that, um, AI can do that very soon. So it, it'll, it'll give a more enticing and engaging experience because it talks to that person at that particular circumstance and at that time. It'll be contextually aware in so many dimensions that's where I see it going and adding some value. Yeah, for sure. And I also want to talk a little bit about humanized design. So um, this is something that I, I gained from experience while working on some of the projects on the chat banking. So a lot of my customers obviously um, wanted to have a live agent experience, but we want to shift that. The reason why is because obviously um, there is actually a lot of information that is repetitive that you know you can easily dig out yourself on the internet or even from the, the resources that we have but it's just that um, a lot of customers they do not want to do that you know that that um, that work themselves they want to call out someone and help to find that page of that information so the talking to a live person is great because then you have to you know it's more natural and it, it feels that there's empathy and you feel that you couldn't find some information, you can make a complaint and be, be sometimes nasty. But with a chat bot, you can't do that, right? <laughs> so you can't score a chat bot, yes. You well, can, not you today. Right? <laughs> do, you, do you think we're going to get that in the future? Get what? Do the, you think in the future that that human touch that you're talking about, so we're talking five to ten yep. years from now, do you think that the computers are going to get smart enough that you don't know the difference? Yes, I think so. It's, it's getting there already. I mean, if you really try to use other chatbots that's more intelligent than what we have currently in our banks, yeah. they, they do have the emotional intelligence to basically re react to, your, to the way you write, the semantics of your language. So that part is actually very interesting. So I think we may be able to go, um, you know, to be able to you know, help our customers to, to feel that they're actually talking to a real person and be able to address their concerns and even emotional uh, upheaval they're having at that point of time, the frustrations. Um, the good thing is 24 seven, this chatbot is there forever and can be your, you know, you can call upon, you can rely upon it, it won't fail you in some ways. If you really want that person to talk to, it's there. But sometimes I just find it hard to reach a, a life agent, that's for sure, because they work from nine to five, which means that the 24 seven society for a human being will be almost impossible in the future too, because which means that you have to monitor the chatbots, you have to monitor, you know, to have shifts to monitor the chatbot and how they in interact with your customers. I don't know, we, you still have to work 24 seven, but then how do we make sure that um, our society allows us to do, you know, have the kind of lifestyle we want, even with the AI in our lives? So that's, a, that's another question. So I think what you were saying though is it's not perfect just yet. Yes, yeah, you not have to just yet. watch. Yeah, you have watch to monitor. Help kind of keep it on the rails as you're moving forward. So yeah. from a design perspective, where do you think in our process or how is our process going to shift designing for these types of experiences where we have systems that are getting smarter and pulling in more data than what we can compute? 
Mm -hmm. What do you see in your research or your testing or any of your journey work that you're doing that could possibly be impacted? Well, I can definitely see the customer journey being impacted because first of all, we need to kind of decide when and where the, what, what customers are trying to do on the site. So when they come in, we will monitor their journeys, we monitor their transactions, we also look at uh, where they will go, and then ultimately where do they drop off and when do they actually seek help from the chatbot. So we should be able to map that journey quite, you know, quite easily and then understand where the frustration or pain point is and then the chatbot will come out and, and rescue the rescue, right? So this is where the chatbot should have enough data information about what the customers has done before, the footprints, right? And then they will, they will give the right intelligible answers to the customers. So this is the part that I think data and design you know, experience could combine to, to make that experience much more seamless again. Yeah. So, so just to add on to, I think what she's saying, it's for sure it's uh, about getting experience either through, uh, everybody prefers to have his own assistant, right? Uh, physically is better, but if you get a virtual assistant that's available to you 24-7, who doesn't want it, right? Means why do you want to go to a website yourself and search for it as you could just tell the person, oh, this is what I want, get me here. So I think chatbots are probably leading us that way, but probably uh, in future there would be demand I don't want to even want to type, right? So I want something like Siri, which I just talk to the person and he gets me thing there. And of course, emotions are something for sure. It needs to be built up because uh, be it for fun or be it for objectivity. Like I said, together with the utility, there should be usability, right? So probably taking care of the semantics of the senten sentences or the localized version of the English that everybody use. Yeah, right. So that should be taken care of together with the emotions and that's probably I think we all are leading in the future that all of us will have our own assistant, assistant and we may not be going to individual apps or individual websites. I just talk to the virtual assistant and say, okay, this is what I want from this place and there you get me what, where I can get from. So really quick, John. So I think what I'm hearing and then I want you to chime in is that Che, what you were touching on is saying because of the data and because of the technology that we have, things like doing our customer journey um, and doing our research and seeing our different segments, our micro segments and micro personas are going to be a lot easier so we can put more thinking to it. And then what you've just touched on is more of a soft skill type thing where we start thinking about language, the locality of the language, up to who the person is. So all of us have different personalities in this room and having a personal assistant that knows how you feel and can pick up and have empathy with you, that sounds like there might be a shift of that more to designers as well. Exactly. I agree with both of you. Actually, uh, I, I see a consolidation of these interfaces happening. There's, there's no need for us to have a dozen messaging apps sitting in our and, and social network apps sitting in our phone that we're constantly opening and closing to access what is basically text, images, and videos. So why do we need to do that? It doesn't make any sense. And you know, for us to have all these proprietary chatbot channels, again, it doesn't make any sense and it's unnecessary work. We can have all that funnel through your personal assistant that knows you and can prioritize based on what things are important to you, and the AI will enable that. Um, you'll have that single point of contact that you feel naturally being able to know with certainty that they'll understand what you want to do and get that routed to the system that's appropriate for it and respond back. So I think you guys bring up a really interesting point, and Che, you touched on this earlier when you were talking about whether or not these chatbots are going to have to handshake, do we really need so many of them, or can, they ultimately, can we ultimately have one to rule them all? But then I guess the question for me becomes, who are we giving that power to? Because we're basically saying, Google, you got this. Apple, you got this. And we're sort of anointing kings in the industry, as opposed to DBS, not your like, area of expertise. You got to give it up to Apple. You know what I mean? And it's like, is, is that consolidation easier for the consumer? Yes. But does it ultimately challenge the idea of a free and open marketplace where you go somebody new and novel on the scene could bring something game changing but Google and Apple are getting so big that they're never going to let that happen or they're never going to want to share or they're okay taking but they're not necessarily going to give back in return. 
It's interesting because I, I also see that there will be, um, you know, we have all these devices. Everyone in this room probably has a phone, a tablet, a computer, a home speaker. And I, I don't see that playing out in the long term. Because there's too many interaction points that behave a bit differently. We've spent the past, I don't know how many number of years, trying to do this Passover where, you know, I'm doing something on my Mac and then, wow, it shows up on my phone. But it's unnecessary. It'll all be in a single point or, or something like that. I can't describe what the interface is for that because it's, it's a number of years out. But That's I don't okay. see us having this sort of collection of devices that we're always having to maintain and grab for certain purposes. It doesn't make sense. So you're seeing a beyond the screen kind of experience that could be central. So what do you think that's going to play out from an experience design perspective? Because we've been designing for a long time, that's all right. of us, and developing. So what does this actually mean? Well, if, if it means that essentially your Ray-Ban sunglasses become the singular interface to all of that, then there you go. So we're, do, we're basically building spatially aware sort of overlaid interfaces which are completely different than what we have right now, screen-based. So we're also talking now about, from an experience design perspective, not just a two-dimensional, me and screen, or even IoT that's three-dimensional. When you start talking spatial, that's starting to get into a different design medium. So how do we bring all these different design perspectives, and how do we get the experts to actually be able to design for these experiences, especially as they're evolving out? Shiva, do you have a point of view? Yeah. Uh, so. I mean, there are a couple. So the, the main uh, problem right now with designers is that we don't look at uh, screen as a medium because we're so used to designing for the screen. So that shift is something that needs to happen sooner than later. So that's when we can think beyond. Otherwise, we are always looking at, at the end product as the final thing, as a screen. So touching upon what he said, that's where I see a immediate change required as such so that we can look beyond and make really better and get where we still don't know where it's going, but yeah. So, With your product bag and your digital bag, what skills do you think would be necessary if you had to be dropped in two years from now and start designing an experience? Uh, a more ho holistic approach, because as I told, like, we shouldn't look at only as a product or only as a screen. That's something that uh, has to probably start at a college level, because uh, we are right now focusing either at a screen or at a software level, which is very constraining. So if we can start thinking from outside and then narrow down, which is not, which often happens. So we immediately start looking at software that we want to learn and screens that we want to design or specialize for iPhone or Android. So that whole approach has to change a little bit. So that. I, I think with this, what's, what's an amazing opportunity is so, say, say, for example, look at iTunes, right? And it's just basically thumbnails of your, of your catalog and then a track list, right? And if you think of what AR or VR can do to that as someone that really loves music, what that can turn into, and when you look at the, you know, the massive amount of access that we have to data, if you look at that you're a house music fanatic, right, and what that can do to extend that experience beyond just a list of files, essentially, you know, for the fact that I can't even zoom in the album cover art, uh, that worries me because I came from a time when albums were these physical things that you look through and you'd literally spend hours just looking at it. And I've talked to many people that have that same thing. Wouldn't it be good to virtualize that and really uh, make it a more engaging experience to listen to music? And that's just, I think, a very small example of where all this stuff is going. It's beyond just lists and thumbnails and, and content cards. Shay, what do you think from an experience point of view? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how far you would go to, to create that experiment, you know, that, that experience that you want. Do you, would you implant a chip in your eye or would you want something to plug into your brain and it downloads things that you will like? I don't, I don't know. I think uh, another thing people talk about these days is cybernetics, you know, half human, half machine, right? My, my husband used to joke, we would create a name called Manchin. <laughs> But it's kind of funny, we, 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 we're just anticipating, we are so, we are so um, uh, in awe by what is going to happen.
but we forgot that um, actually the technologies, I was just talking to our designers here, we're talking, the technology is catching up so fast that we have, don't have time to really think what we need it for sometimes. Do we actually need all these things? Do we actually need to have, um, you know, an AI that could, you know, basically be a, a, a kind of a, a service, uh, 20, you know, a service person 24-7 for you? Then what do we do? Do we just slack? <laughs> so what do we become? Do we become a beach bummer? Is that what we all wanted? Or let AI succeed in, you know, at all the robots succeed in the future? I don't know. This is a bit of a better question, but I want to go down there. That's okay. What about... <laughs> yeah, but I think even though what you're touching on is we're mm -hmm. talking about the rise of specialists. Yeah. So being really deep, but also being deep in a couple verticals, right? So what having do, to be yeah. aware across as well as getting in. How would you yourself going back to the question of like two years from now, mm. right, and technology has changed, how would you yourself, like what skills would you be looking for to increase or what do you see in our methods or mm. processes that are changing? Because they've been, they, I'd say UX design for the last 20 years has been pretty consistent. We do research, we figure it out, we build personas, we do customer journeys against it, we have business goals, then we go into ideation design, right, against those pain points. Tools that are coming out that are making it easier are data points that we can track, not just I, but now we have all of the, um, the different data points just even with like your bio versus even the physical space. And then we have machine learning and tools that are now pulling massive data points that are giving us more insight than we ever have. How is that going to continue to evolve if we're looking at like an AR, VR life, if we're looking at blockchain, right? If we're looking at IoT, what does that mean for a user test? Because we're no longer a screen to a test, we're looking at an ecosystem. Okay, um, I'll attempt to answer that difficult question. First of all, will I still be a researcher, right? Um, will I still be a designer or will you still, people around here will you still code? Because if effectively a machine could code for you in the future, right? Then what would you do? Then. Uh, I think the process will definitely change, but I think we, we probably need to think about what AI is best, or you know, machine learning, or what is that, whatever we call that, is, is best for whatever they do. And then what we humans do is to identify you know, the so-called insights and outcome and analyze them and how we can turn that into a, a product or something that is meaningful and useful in our own lives and you know, enhancing ourselves, for instance, Maybe in terms of medical, um, you know, the, the, the domain that we can think of is, you know, targeting a certain kind of, uh, for example, cancer treatment, things like that. How do we use uh, the data and how do we actually understand the kind of different patients, how do they feel about the, the treatment and how do we make sure that the treatment could target for, for them and help them to get better. So those are the things that we think uh, that could potentially be useful. Understanding the person. So as researcher, I mean, may, I may not be a researcher in the future, but maybe somebody who really goes around to understand and talking to people, getting their connection, understanding their needs, understanding their pain points, and then um, getting the, 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 the so-called AI to help me to collect the data and then analyze and then help me to, to create a product that is useful. I think that is probably the, the basis of it. But I don't know how the process is, yeah. <laughs> So I'd love to really build upon that because I think one of the areas that I see UX designers really focusing on moving forward, especially in this AI future, is almost to become technology or AI's ombudsman. Now I know that that's a weird word and it's also sort of a throwback to a dying uh, industry of newspapers, right? But an ombudsman is basically the gut check for a newspaper of record that says you've reported fairly and justly on this, you left out this side of the story, um, you didn't actually sort of uh, give readers all of the facts that they needed to make a fair and balanced assessment. And I wonder if UX designers, Jay, to your point, are gonna be taking all of this information and taking all of these uses of technology and AI and cryptocurrency and AR and VR and going, should we be doing this? Is Facebook accomplishing its sort of stated mission, vision, purpose using technology in this way? And is it being done at the expense of the consumer or for the benefit of the consumer? 
Um, I'm picking on Facebook a little bit today, but um, they're, they're a big behemoth in this space, right? So easy to do a little bit of. And I wonder in that instance, are we going to be able to almost push technology, which is this technology in particular, unless you are um, an artificial intelligence specialist or a mach machine learning scientist, feels a little bit like a black box into a place of further transparency where people feel like they can have an opinion about whether or not this AI is working for them or against them or to the benefit of their community or counterintuitive to the stated sort of goals and desires of the community. Um, and I think that maybe that's where UX will start to push in terms of becoming more the not just user experience designer but sort of human experience designer in many respects. You know, I'd say uh, when we start getting out into the 10-year mark, I, I'd say, you know, right now we're, we're kind of very constraint-based design. Uh, if you look at the screen size, you look at, you know, having to touch a screen, there are immense constraints that that creates in the interface and what you can do with that. As soon as you eliminate that, and that's out of the equation, you suddenly have an unlimited way of interacting and we have to relearn how, how that plays out. Secondly, the constraint is we don't actually have a lot of information. We don't have a lot of data coming in. We've got bits and pieces that are sitting on databases and there's often constraints in terms of accessing that information and having engineering effort expended in, in utilizing that. When that becomes unlimited as well, and we have so many data points coming in, I think we'll become the specialists of knowing when and why and the how of how to best utilize that. And, the, you know, the AI can't do that. The AI is just simply, you know, responding. We'll have an amazing opportunity to shape that. And I think the ombudsman thing, I, that's what we are now, but I think it'll, it'll play, or should be now, it'll be even more important, you know, down the road for sure, yeah. So I guess uh, I agree with the point which uh, she made about ombudsman because f for sure if you, are, if you are designing something with emotions, with almost equal power that you are, you should be, have a con you should be able to control it somewhere, right? Because like what she said, you don't want to be just slacking around and let someone do the thing. So, so long you have a minimal control that's, that you required on the person should be good enough for you to let the person do the job for you, be it a virtual, of course virtually because that's where we are looking for. And as far as data is uh, concerned, of course, uh, I think it comes over the period, right? So uh, let's say I, 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 I design a person now, after interacting the data, the, the, there are data points which the, the virtual assistant will be collecting from you and probably creating an image of you that, okay, what, the, what could be the need of uh, I shouldn't be saying the word master, but probably what could be the need of my master that he would need at these, these hours of the time or at these, point, at these points in the day, right? So probably that's where the data collection happens and that's where the intelligence gets built up and that's where the artificial intelligence would probably be taking over a lot of your workloads and I think that's what we want them to do, not the whole life, I guess. Yeah, adding to what he's saying, uh, it's, I mean, here, there's, uh, we designers, uh, we adapt to change probably faster than anybody else in the industry, and we are forced to do it. So, we are, I mean, that's what we are good at, being flexible, thinking out of the box. So, that's, uh, we are always playing catch up with the technology no matter what because we are not driving technology. So the processes are going to change and even now if you see it, uh, user testing and uh, the results, the cycles of features have really been shortened like even if you look at e-commerce, uh, just through data analytics you can release features for a couple of weeks and if it's not working, A-B testing, it just, you have solid data to back it up. So you can actually take a lot more risk because of the data we have. Mm -hmm. So the testing is backed solid. I mean, we have solid backing for all the testing. We do a lot more than we had before. So the product life cycles have become short because of that in general. Yeah. So it sounds like dynamic product life cycles. Yeah. 
and designing for a dynamic product life cycle, which is different than like a scrum, right? Or a small epic. What's interesting here that you guys have all kind of touched on is Shay, you, you were talking about how um, we'll have the tools that are gonna do the heavy lifting for us so that we can do more of a focus in on the human aspect. I know in school programs, you might have psychology today, right? Or looking at empathy or human design. What you've brought up, Caitlin, is getting into the ethics. And I know I personally have never taken an ethics course in 20 years of design. And is that something in our future? And is that something that's gonna go into legal? I mean, when we start looking at human, uh, Facebook, not to pick on Facebook, I think Facebook is amazing, but when you look at what they've just recently gone through, even in our American election, with where you had an outside country supposedly help influence an internal vote with how they were doing ads, this is not something I don't think Facebook thought about 20, you know, 15 years ago when they came out. And where does that place us as a designer who are creating tools for that? So we've talked about ethics, right? And then you've just talked about shorter time frames that allows us to not have to be in the common life cycle that we see today because we can be on demand with our testing because we have data and try more things and be more rapid. So it sounds like key skill sets that we're gonna have to look for is um, change management, right? And I don't know how many of you have taken change management courses or are clear with that potentially into an ethics land, which is interesting. Uh, diving deep into science of some sort. It could be you're an AI specialist or a machine learning specialist or you're working with these logarithms. Um, building out your empathy, right? Do you guys think that there's anything else that are within that list? Yeah, I think there's two things that we're gonna come back into the spotlight that I think we haven't, we haven't neglected, but I think I see a lot of cases where they've, they, they haven't had the attention paid to that they should. Uh, Firstly, information architecture. If we're going from, a, say, a 2D environment to a 3D environment, our relationship with categories and how we structure information will likely change, and we'll have to rethink about it. Likewise, with interfaceless design, if we're talking with Siri or Alexa or whatever, the information architecture of how that's presented, again, I think is quite different, and we're going to have to rediscover that. Secondly, I think, uh, as UX, there's always this emphasis on designing in terms of a visual perspective, but I think we often tend to forget the other part of that is the written word, which is often why they're at where they are, because so that they can digest the, the content, and we should get back to writing the written word well, purposed for these new audiences. So when you're in an interfaceless design and you're just sitting there babbling away to Alexa, those responses, somebody has to write those responses, and it has to have, you know, this it has to have a persona, it has to have a consistency and a reliability in how it's conveying messages, and I think we need to get back to that. Likewise, if we're in some virtual environment, how do we consume that written word? It's, it's fascinating. I think those are two things that'll come back. I would also build upon that and say I think one of the Accessibility has always been a focus of experienced designers, but I think as we're looking at these new interaction paradigms and methods for communication, we're starting to see the rise of new accessibility challenges, which haven't quite been mastered. And if we are gonna move to a place where everything is controlled by voice, what sort of fail-safes do we put in place so that others who don't have that option still have the ways to interact with the world in the same way that everybody else does? Okay, quickly, Cold Deep, I'm looking at you for time because I want to make sure you guys are good. Okay. No, we can do Q&A. Yeah. Questions. I'm sure they are curious. And tired. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for us before you escape? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, hi, I have a question because for all of this discussion I was wondering, even the earlier discussion, I have a feeling that in this whole process the user is, in our consideration, is a bit like lonely. Even in the word user experience there's just one person, but in the end we are a community and the people always exist with other people. So what are the considerations for AI? If there are any like an opportunities or threats, how the AI may impact the people interaction in, a, in the society because like even like what you mentioned the Facebook the ads were targeted towards the 
users, the, the single user, which as a big group affected the whole country and in some sort the whole world. So, yeah, any, any thoughts on that? I think it's a really interesting question that you raise because um, one of the powers of um, all of the technology that we see emerging right now is connection and the power that you start, I mean, isn't that in essence what's powering blockchain is this idea of networked computers that come together. So it's not any one single source of information or truth, but rather a network or community. And I think in that instance, communities of people and users as well hold a lot of power in terms of how and where they're shifting brands and organizations, where they're starting to say, you know, we want something different, or conversely, our needs aren't being supported. Um, and I think, to me, one of the biggest things that you're going to start to see from a community aspect is the rise in the importance of reputation and how individuals are representing themselves to the broader community and how we're ultimately forming trust networks. It's why you're going to go to an Airbnb and trust that, you know, the sheets are going to be clean and the towels are going to be hanging where you think they're going to be. And conversely, why somebody's going to let you into their home and know that you're not going to throw a rager of a party while they're gone. Um, and I think in that way, community and networked communities are going to expand. Um, it's less going to be about sort of your trusted circle that you might know and interact with because you live in the same um, floor of the apartment block. Um, and AI will help facilitate those connections and that sort of wider trust barrier would be one impact. I also think that that's, that was really good. So I, I also think that when you're talking about like what AI means to the community, there's the low hanging fruit, like the things that we can use, I think today in the next few years, right? That's going to change. But what do we do like when you have like the, you know, Elon Musk talking about the responsibility and policies that need to be put in place because these computers can get smart and what does it mean to community and what happens when we create systems that can begin thinking, right? Because that's true AI, right? Like that's, 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 that's the general, that's the future. And I don't think anyone's really laid down what those repercussions are to community. And I think that's why when ethics kind of came up here and understanding what that means and what that means to large bodies getting into like government and policy and how we govern it is going to be extremely important because we're going to have a responsibility, right? And, and that's not, I mean, there is a responsibility design. There always is, like banking, right? We have to make sure that we guarantee that, you know, you have a secure login, right? Now with autonomous driving, we have to ensure that cars aren't going to go crashing into each other. There's always that responsibility, but I think that the stakes are going to get heightened as we as humans try to process what this is. And I don't think there's any set answer. So I think from a community perspective, the reputation and trust is going to rise in importance in our, in our everyday, like in the stuff that we kind of do now. But as for when we are get, and I think, I think we're close, actually. I don't think, you know, this is 20 years out. You know, they just created, what was it? Uh, was it Google that did the, um, the Go, where it was, they created these two computers that I forgot the actual technical term, where they can actually um, battle out with each other and create like what the strategies are and then they could beat the Go players and they were learning. So they're learning quicker than I think we know what to do with. And so I, I, we're in, I think we're going to be entering into a new land. And that's personally why I've started actually looking at policy and ethics myself to prepare myself to be able to answer some of these questions. And I've never, ever thought that in my design career, because I started as a designer, that I would consider these things. So that's, that's why I, share. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Are, there, are there any others? Yeah, me. Yes. <laughs> uh, my question is sort of along those lines, and it's about the idea of control and power. So there's lots of tentacles to this jellyfish. You know, they're just going everywhere, and it's it's becoming. A, you know, just listening to your panel discussion, it's becoming so multifaceted and and almost out of control. And there's lots of catch up. So I'm wondering then about control, about it, just like you were saying, is, is ethics then the thing that will be the controlling power? And another thing is, you know, uh, you were saying that particular brands will be 
the, the trusting point, but those brands were, aren't necessarily trustworthy. So how does all that fit in with you know, the power and the control and, and it all fits in with ethics? So I just wondered where you see sort of the next step then, because it's obviously it's a big issue and it's not necessarily being addressed. And from a user perspective, you know, people with kids and things, you know, they, they worry about that kind of thing. How do we consider that at this point? Big question. I, I, yeah, and I, I don't have a direct answer, but I have something that weighs on my mind that relates to it. And if you look at the ruling that recently occurred with net neutrality, right, and we've, we've sort of handed back uh, the companies, the ability to sort of shape how we're going to experience the internet. What I see coming 20 years from now, after we've all handed in our car keys, is place neutrality. And I think to me that has a much greater threat of us losing our freedoms as people when a company or a government can dictate where we can go, at what times we can go, and at what costs we can go at. That's an amazing thing to think about, and that really starts going into that territory when a company can say, you can go to this place, but not that place, or that place costs us double, or the government says it's curfew time, and, uh, or decides certain segments of people can drive at a certain day and others can't. It's, it's fascinating. But uh, who's going to control all that, I, given we just relinquished it for the internet? Well, right? I, yeah, but I also think, like, uh, the press, for example. So Uber, right? And I love Uber. I use Uber Eats, I use Uber Car, whatever. They ju we just found out there was a massive security breach here, right, in Singapore. So there's a transparency, and it happened over a year ago. So I think what's going to happen is, um, from a consumer perspective, because we have so much choice, we really do. Even though we're saying there's consolidation, you don't have to use Uber. You've got a bazillion other different things. And I think that there's going to be a backlash from consumers because we're going to start to expect that the brand's just going to have that transparency and that protection. And if they don't, they're going to be accountable. And so we as designers, what I would say is, is our responsibility, just kind of like when I started working in e-commerce many years ago before there was a thing called PCI compliance, which we have now, right, which protects, you know, people's credit card information and things like that to ensure and how, you know, how data stored and making sure that people can't just, you know, get the credit. It's, it's supposed to protect us as a consumer. We're going to see more things like that. And just like our responsibility, and I remember when that was first coming out and before that had even been declared, a lot of the questions and answers that we had about security and working with our software brethren. So I think that gets into like kind of that cross collaboration. And then I think it's just going to come down to your own individual choice of where do you want to work, right? So if I'm in an organization where they're not putting the consumer up front or their safety or protection or they're trying to bury that thing, I don't know how comfortable I would be. So I think we're getting into a new age of design where I hadn't really been thinking about that. Usually most companies I was super excited to go work for, it's great technology, but I hadn't thought about that aspect of how are they being within the community, how are they protecting the community, what's their reputation, and I think that's increased in importance because we are becoming a digital currency, you know, regardless if it's money, your personal data, or whatever, and when that leaks out, that has massive repercussions to our everyday lives. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to touch on Melissa's point of view about, uh, and also um, Caitlin's point of view about brand, brand loyalty, maybe a little bit more about the reputation as well. I think the reason why you like a brand is also, the brand itself has probably been built up many years and then it's in, you know, top of mind. You could be your parents using that brand for a long time and it could be yourself having very good experience with it before, but maybe uh, it has fault a little bit, but then you still have trust in the brand. So I guess it's like, it's that persona, uh, the persona of a brand needs to be built up, you know, in, in a way that people, through the culture of the company too, like people you hire, for instance, Uber, we know the CEO is, uh, uh, have a lot of, um, you know, interesting views these days, but I thought the culture of the company is important, but the, the, the reason why I stress it is because DBS, right, um, it's, it's been a national bank for many years, and um, even though um, we, we have other competitors in the market, but uh, the brand itself has, actually resonates with a lot of locals. 
So we still remain a strong brand and uh, hence we remain competitive in, in many ways. But I see a lot of newcomers, I mean, new, new bands coming in, like Europe and a Simple Bank and all this kind of brands, uh, digital bands keep coming up. But um, I, I believe this, these uh, so-called disruptors have very short lifetime. You know, they have, they have a lot to prove themselves. So if something went wrong, people would just uh, kind of go away and try something else. And especially with the millennials, they are not loyal as well. So they're only loyal because their parents are using that brand and it's been passed down to them, say a word of mouth or, you know, through many years of experiencing it with themselves, then they like the brand. So I thought um, that's something to think about because I think culture in an organization is important. Who you hire, who you interface with, in the, you know, with the employees of the bank, that is the, the reason why you like that brand as well. It's not just the brand, the name, yeah. If there are no more questions, then I would like to call it uh, close of this panel discussion. Sorry. Okay, so with all the um, evolution that's going on, all the changes that's coming out, I just really wanted to know your own personal point of view to how open you are with the, t the changes coming and in your own um, uh, different experiences, how are you guys actually like accepting these changes and evolution? Is it a positive one or a negative one for your own? Yeah. I'm embracing it. Otherwise, you become obsolete, right? And so to, to back that up, the number of conversations I've had with individuals that are, are really be, uh, becoming subject matter experts around blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and things like that, a lot of conversations over coffees and beers, etc over the past number of uh, months because I need to prepare myself. I, I can't keep designing, you know, uh, shopping cart checkouts and, you know, the same way, I'll, I'll be gone, right? This, this, is, this is mandatory that we all go and embrace this stuff. Uh, yeah. So for me, I think only constant that's available in technology is change. So you have to follow the change or you have to lead the change. So you have to just decide, are you going to be the leader who made the change or are you just going to follow that? So if you can't be the leader, be the follower at least. So there will be a point in time where you can evolve something new from there and you could be the leader there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not being scared, I guess. I mean, it's always, uh, when you think about how fast the technology is changing, you're always apprehensive and uh, that so being not scared and just going along with the flow as you told i mean it's like there's some kind of fear you like it or not because of getting, getting left behind it's like so yeah <laughs> yeah one of the negatives to it that can be is fatigue so it because there is so much that's happening and so many things to keep up and so much information that you sometimes get fatigued. So I think one of the key things that we're gonna have to think of as designers is not only the excitement, like your personality, I think has to be okay. Again, we talked about change management earlier and that's just adapting to change, but it's also how do you, how do you break yourself from fatigue so that you give your mind a break and that you can jump back in because it actually requires your brain to be at peak performance what we're talking about between the lead and the follow and some of these technologies of where we are, this isn't a place where you can just kind of chill out and relax and not be really active. It is if you're working within the screen methodology and kind of today, but these other di like diameters that we're talking, our parameters, dimensions, I think we're gonna have to focus a little bit more on self-care. Um, do we wanna be a peak performer? What does that mean? How do we keep our mind ultimately healthy so that we don't get burnt out? And that's something that I've experienced for the last 20 years, and I find that it's kind of growing. It could be because I'm getting old, but it also, I think, because the technology is getting more complex. Like there's, there's, when we start talking omni-channels and things, when I first started, yeah, I was looking at shop management software like in a shop and how users interacted with, you know, the car, but they were looking at a single screen to fix that data. The journeys that I deal with now are voice, conversational text, environment, you know, um, pulling in all the different multiple connected dots, dealing with shit tons, tons of data, and being able to make sense of it. And then having this evolving kind of technology come. So I do think it's embrace, 
But I also think um, get those meditation apps, take your self-care, or you're going to burn. I've seen designers actually burn out recently because it's just like, oh my god, it's so intense. So you got to have those breaks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd say that's really good advice. I really do. You know, the, the meditation, I, the amazing, yeah, that's right, whatever, whatever form that is for you, that, that works for you, I think is very important. And I also think that companies have to move away with, from the concept that for you to be productive, you need to work from nine to six and sit at a desk in a white room, uh, open concept glass tower office to, to create these beautiful experiences. I think they need to move away from that and accept that the creative process is not optimal in those conditions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and also that like nowadays uh, more and more, uh, uh, you're not expected to do everything. I mean, that is something, the trend, especially for designers where uh, uh, you may have seen a lot of job openings where you need to do right from say research till coding. So actually living up to that is not something that should be done or doing, although it's been a recent trend. So tr it's also staying in, uh, in sync with the technology but also knowing what you want to do because there is so much happening there. If you want to do everything, you'll just skim through everything and you won't actually know anything. So if you know what you want and you can plan for it, then you can have in-depth knowledge about one thing and really contribute, yeah, that'll really help. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think I'll have to uh, put a hard stop to this. Um, um, maybe the questions can be discussed over the networking session, uh, which you can, I think, decide the time yourself. Uh, I just want to uh, thank everybody on the panel for this great discussion. Uh, I'm sure that there are no answers, to be honest, and that's why it's good that you didn't ask any question because, uh, because there are no clear answers at this stage, that's what I think. Uh, but it's actually good that we have such discussions which sets, uh, in a way, a tone for the future. And at least one message that was clear is that uh, designers uh, need to catch up and this is a phase which is confusing for everybody. Nobody knows uh, what's, what's going to happen, but you need to choose your paths uh, or choose your routes uh, wisely so that at least you are not left behind. So that's, that's the only conclusion I can make out of it, but if you have a conclusion, you can tell something about this and then we can call this a close. I think, I think the conclusion is, is that anytime we have uh, technology that accelerates and that's the period that we're in right now, there is confusion of how it's going to shake out, but I do think that there are some clear pathways today. So when we're talking about AI in the marketplace, I do think things like conversational UI, voice UI, utilizing service bots, you know, for uh, customer service, um, sales in a, in a marketplace, security. These are skill sets that designers need today and they need to focus in on today. So if you're not getting it in school, you're not getting it in your career, I guarantee you're going to find an online source. There is online courses on this. You have MIT. There's a couple of really amazing um, universities that offer free courses on this. There's going to need to be a lot of self-learning and a lot of community. Um, as for where this rolls out from like a, a moral stance or these types of things, that's going to continue to evolve. But if you don't understand nat natural language processing, if these are all new words to you, my recommendation to you is find a course or start Googling. Because in the next two years, it's going to be here and you better know how to design for it. So the generalist statement that Shiv just talked about, you can't be. So that trend that you're hearing about coding, you know, uh, UI design, UX design, yes, that can uh, happen depending on the organization structure and what the product offering is, but as it gets more complex, you're going to need to be more specialized or you're not going to get those jobs. And that's the marketplace today, yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. And I think uh, this is time to, to give a round of applause to the panel. Um, Uh, it's been some uh, some great discussions around here. Uh, I would like to give a small token of appreciation to um, to each of your, the panelists here. Um, it's a small sum of money. You're not going to be rich with this, uh, uh, but maybe you want to get down because it's, it sounds a bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, so here is this for Kathleen. Uh, here it is. Thank you very much. Uh,
Uh, so I have to do a bit of running around as the names pop up. <laughs> so Shay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, Shiva, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you so much. Uh, and this is Melissa. Oh, okay. You didn't Here you to. go. Thank you. Yeah, and Sulab. So, thanks a lot. And um, yeah. And just last point before you go out is that uh, we had this team of volunteers without which this was not possible. Half of them were coming from other countries, so they have left already because the bus flight was flying off or the bus was leaving. So all of them, can you please come in the front so that, and please uh, request you uh, to give them a good applause. Uh, because right from the time, the, because these guys used to come early around 7.30 here, that's the story behind, and they leave, and all this arrangement that you see here, right from removing the trash to setting up all this for the next day, all has been done by us, and these are actually, all of them either are students, they are lecturers in polytechnics, um, some of them are, um, are, are, let's say, UX professionals, and, um, and yeah, what else can I say, yeah. So, so all of them are actually just people like you and me, uh, and they are not hired per hour basis. Uh, so it's a great sense that it brings because uh, the community, this is what is community. You, you do say things for yourself, uh, by yourself. And that's where I think these guys have shown the great spirit. It's unfortunate that only half of them are right now here, but uh, still I think um, a big thanks to them. Yeah, so now it's time for the... Yeah. Okay, so I think now it's, uh, it's time for the wine session and then uh, mingling and singling or whatever you call it. And then we, uh, uh, I would just wish you all a, a good week ahead and great holidays. And of course our hello, dot, hello at uxsca.com.info is open. So you can always write email to us and we will respond. Yeah, thanks very much and hope you enjoyed the, the show here. Thanks a lot. Yay. Bye.